Hi guys, Oliver here from Spitfire Audio. I hope you are doing well. In this episode of Writing in a Style of, we've invited back the fantastically talented Dan Keen, who uses our studio woodwinds to take inspiration from Danny Elfman's score to Edward Scissorhands. Dan, please take it away. Thanks, Oliver. Danny Elfman is one of my absolute favourite film composers. From Batman to Beetlejuice, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory to The Simpsons, so much of his music has underscored my favourite films and TV shows that I've enjoyed watching while growing up. And in particular, I think his collaboration with Tim Burton has allowed him to tap into his slightly zany, quirky compositional style that we know and love him for. Now, when it came to writing a piece of music in the style of Edward Scissorhands, I knew that I needed to kind of combine lots of Danny Elfman's famous genres. I love that in his music he can have really unusual rhythms and kind of crazy harmony but at the same time can have this beautiful tune that goes over the top and actually this works to the favour of Edward's character who is actually quite innocent but trapped in this slightly chaotic 1950s suburban world and so I've created a beautiful tune in 3-4 to kind of tell the fairy tale kind of sound and I've also used the celeste and harp and other high-pitched percussive instruments to give the sense of sort of we're, we're somewhere wintry, we're somewhere far away, and I've even used sleigh bells in places. Then I've kind of gone on to something a little bit more chaotic, something a bit more like the Cookie Factory uh, cue, which is quite kind of scary and bombastic, so it's got low woodwinds and things like that, to emulate Danny Elfman's sound. And then finally I've taken inspiration from cues like the Final Confrontation, which takes the kind of main tune as a reprise, but then mixed with this hyper kind of chaotic world. If I were to sum this library up in one word, it would be control. There was just so much definition there. Even as far back as the Ambient and Outrigger microphones, you get a real sense of the room, but it's a directness that is quite surprising really because for me I tend to prefer libraries that were recorded in the Hall at Air Studios to get that really kind of grand reverberant sound but I found that this directness is actually very easy to work with and as you'll see my piece is quite complicated and yet it was actually relatively easy to put together. So I'm going to play you the piece of music first and then I'll go through and show you how I've written each part.
I have had so much fun working on this piece. I'm sure you can tell just how much I've enjoyed it. It's one of those pieces that, you know, you just keep willing more and more ideas into it. And obviously, it's quite intricate in places. But as I mentioned before, actually quite easy to represent with these samples. I'm going to show you how I've written the whole piece and kind of go through it and show how I've kind of linked it with Danny Elfman's Edward Scissorhands score. But first, I just want to show you the main kind of star of the show, which is the Studio Woodwinds. And in this case, I've used the Professional Library. Now, in case you have the core version and you're looking to upgrade to the professional or you don't have either and you're considering one or the other just to give you a few kind of key differences number one professional has five extra instruments you get the core anglais the alto and bass flute contrabass clarinet and contrabassoon and i've used four of the five of these in this piece and it really has made a difference the other thing which i think is great is that you get six different mic options so you get a really sensible number of um, different kind of recordings from different places within the room and actually you get a really good variance too between close one and close two sounds quite different and tree one and tree two sounds quite different as well so for core anglais you can see here i've used a balance between the close one tree two and ambient microphones and this just enables you to kind of get a bit of a hyped mix the tree microphones sit above the podium so that's typically what you'd kind of imagine as an orchestral sound but if you want a slightly more hyped arrangement in particular here where we've got lots of soloistic lines that come in kind of rear their head in a more kind of grander orchestral setting this close mic works really really well but the ambient also just helps to give a bit more of the sense of the room and can sometimes help to cover over little legato transitions which as you know are probably more difficult to create with samples than kind of slower sweeping tunes things like that so the first thing to show you really is that i sketch everything with an electric piano and if i just show you what it sounds like from the beginning If we then compare that with what it became, you can tell it's not actually that different. So I always like to play my ideas in first. This works really, really well for a few different reasons. First of all, by the end of a day, I've probably mapped out the idea. So I've got the whole kind of breadth of the tune. I know what I'm going to do and where, but it also allows me to kind of get in there and define the pace. So. If I know that there's going to be a kind of a verse two or whatever, you know, I don't have to bring out the sleigh bells just yet because I know that that's going to come later on, things like that. You'll notice that if I just show you the project, we've got a few different things. This is typically ordered how it would be on a score. So with woodwinds at the top and then brass, I'm using studio brass. And then for keys, I'm actually using a combination of the BBC SO Celeste and harp and also the Spitfire orchestral grand piano. This is the contextual grand piano. Then for percussion, I'm using a range of the Bernard Herrmann Composer Toolkit, which was recorded in the same room as studio orchestra so it works quite well and then I've also got uh, a couple of things from the BBC SO as well the triangle the toys glockenspiel marimba xylophone then finally at the bottom I've got strings and I'm using the studio strings for this as well what I really like about this string orchestra is is a much more controlled sound as I said with the studio woodwinds as well so you get eight six 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 four so it's a smaller slightly more kind of chamber sounding ensemble finally at the top here I've got the choir and this isn't what you might think this isn't Eric Whitaker choir it's Labs Choir, and actually this has worked really, really well just to kind of bring out the essence of the choir that Danny Elfman used. He used a boys and women's choir, I believe. So I'm just going to kind of take you through it uh, piece by piece. It starts off with a melody in the cor anglais. So we begin in A flat major, and just to start off with, to give it that sense of waltz, the kind of strong one beat. I've got bass pizzicato, a triangle, bass drum, and the bass clarinet short tenuto, just to help kind of punctuate that first beat of every bar. Quite simple, really. On the second beats, I've also got a bassoon legato. I decided to go for legato because I wanted a sense of growing with each beat, and this comes in on beat two. Next, if we add in the clarinets as well, this starts to establish the harmony as well as the little counter melody as well.
The only other thing to articulate here really is the kind of wintry theme. So I've got the celeste and harp here doing a little thing here. And if I just play it with the bass drum, you'll hear the kind of sense of one and then the little arpeggios following. So relatively simple all round. Um, I've got a few string lines as well. And you can see that I'm using the Tremolando uh, Consordino. So this is that kind of silvery quality up at the top, gives it a little upper edge sheen that I really like. You can also hear quite a few harp flourishes. Um, this is something that Danny Elfman does a lot in his scores, particularly for The Simpsons, always has that kind of slightly uh, floaty quality to them. I find that this really just helps to kind of flourish into a beat one. So it'd almost be like doing a roll on a bass drum or on a snare drum, just to kind of enter into that new section. We've got a few more instruments coming in now. We've got the piccolo and the flutes playing trills, and this just helps to give it a sense of kind of bubbly floatiness above it. You can also see here that I'm going between the three clarinets playing legato to a couple of clarinets. So this is the solo legato, and this is great if you want a kind of more intimate sound, a more soloistic sound, but if you want it more to be like a section, um, you'd go for the group of three. And you can see that as I've gone through the piece, as it gets louder, I tend to go for more players. So the beginning, I'm playing just with one soloist, one cor anglais. By the end, I might play the uh, solo on, you know, three bassoons, something like that. I find this works really well in film scores because often you end up compressing the dynamic range a little bit and sometimes to give it that sense of scale that sense of kind of changing gear sometimes it's best to start with a smaller group of players and then expand to a larger group after that so if we go through here you can see that the main melody is being played by clarinets and then there's a counter melody by the oboe I'm also using the studio brass here just to give it a little bit of growth. And I find it works really well to use the legato lines. Um, just a single trumpet there, you can hear the vibrato in it. It's really, really characterful. Next, you can see here that I've used a couple more percussive instruments as well. I'm using the Bernard Herrmann snare drum with the snares turned on, uh, just a little kind of buzz roll. And then I've also got the soft hit stick timpani. Now this bit sounds like it's all shifted gear. Only a few elements have really been added. So it's quite simple what this verse two does. I've moved the melody now to the bassoon. But it was too similar to what we heard before and there wasn't that sense of kind of drive. So I decided to add this little staccato melody. So if I play that with the tune now. And I also decided to bring that out as well with the strings. It's only soft. And so the celli here are playing pizzicato. So that kind of reinforces the two, three, and then the basses have the one, two, three. This means that we can kind of keep the, uh, the quavers going at the same time. 
Now these sound pretty punchy, but for the clarinets and bass clarinet, I'm only actually using tree two, which goes to show just how kind of defined each of these notes sound within a slightly smaller recording environment. To add to the sense of sort of drama and excitement, I've also added these runs on the piccolo and flute an octave apart. And I decided to opt for using the legato rather than just straight runs because I had a little bit more control there. Now as we go into this section, this is where we realise that things might not be quite right and so I'm going to refer back to my sketches here. Now at the end of this second verse, I wanted to feel like things were maybe a little bit darker, so I wanted to modulate into a different key, and so it modulates into G minor by the time we reach to this point. Have a listen to this. So we're modulating to G minor using a series of diminished chords. So this is an A diminished chord. And then this next chord is it's sort of E major, but it kind of rises from a G to a G sharp. And then this, you've sort of got D major at the bottom and an F sharp major at the top. And so basically, as long as everything's moving to the new key, everything will be fine. Um, and so in the voice leading, really, I'm just using these little melodies just to kind of bring it towards the tonal centers of that new key. It's quite easy to do, really. You've just got to find notes within those chords. Um, and so it's kind of led by the clarinet. And then if you take something that goes the other way, so it comes up, I've got um, a D here in the bass clarinet. So that's just a nice little transition. It kind of ties things together. I'm also using the harp again, just to kind of bring out little elements. It's then met with a second harp, and I found that in Danny Elfman's scores, he often uses two harps, having one coming up and then one coming down. So the two combined. And that's just another diminished chord as well. Now, another kind of Danny Elfman trick here is to use some small bits of kind of high pitched percussion. So, this is taken out of the BBC SO toys. The first one is just a little wood block, and then the second one here is a set of castanets. Now to give it this sense of weight going from one chord to the other, I'm using a few different things. To start off with, we've got this timpani and bass drum rolls. I'm then also using some tremolo here in the studio strings. Just a little bit, but it gives it a slight kind of icy quality. And then you'll notice these are the things that Danny Elfman does all the time, using really high-pitched percussion to kind of bring out the slight kind of tension. So I'm using glockenspiel and marimba here. It's still playful, but it's just a little bit sinister. Using the same tune again, but in a slightly kind of twisted way. I absolutely love this cor anglais sound, it's really, really expressive. I'm also using the contrabass clarinet and the contrabassoon as well. These are both only available in the professional library. And they really just help to kind of ground that first beat of every bar. Wow. 
I'm using the bassoon here as well just to introduce some of these elements that Danny Elfman does a lot, which is to have a slow-moving chromatic line that just it adds a little bit to the harmony, but it just makes it feel a little bit kind of unnerving. So again, we're kind of reprising the main tune, but it's definitely got something going on in the background that makes it a little bit unsettling. I'm using the choir as well here just to kind of bring out that slightly ominous sound, and I really love the way this sounds with the orchestra. To kind of take on from the staccato tune we heard in verse 2, I'm also using some more staccato here in the bass clarinet. Okay, now we go into the crazy thing. Just before we do, we've got some stopped horns here which just help to build a little bit of tension. and that muted sound makes it very, very metallic sounding. We also had it earlier on here. Okay, so this next section might sound very kind of complicated. It's not actually that complicated. What I wanted was to have a riff of some sort. So I started with the contrabass clarinet and the contrabassoon. which sounded good, but I think it needed a little bit more definition. So I decided to add the bass clarinet and three bassoons as well. That definitely does it. So you can see here that with the bass clarinet, I'm using a combination of tree two and close two. And then in the staccato bassoons, I'm using close one and tree two. And you can see I'm using almost the whole of the close signal here. So this is another benefit of the professional library, just getting that little bit more definition. If I show you what it sounds like without the close, sounds really nice, you get a real nice kind of stereo image, but as soon as I add that close mic, it just sounds that little bit more kind of percussive, which is what I wanted for this score. So from that point, um, we're not in any kind of particular key at this point, we're just kind of playing around really. So I decided to add some multi-tongues here. I decided to go for solo clarinet with this one because I'm having them play a two-note chord. So if I were to have three clarinets, that would be like six clarinets playing in total. So I didn't really want that. But this allows you to get a little bit more definition too. And you can see I'm only using the tree one. If I were to introduce close one, you get much more of the breath, much more of the sound of the reed. I wanted this to feel sort of like it was coming out of nowhere, so decided just to stick with the tree microphones. I've also introduced the bass flute here. Alongside the flutes. Something else that Danny Elfman does a lot is to use core on glaze staccato notes, so I decided to throw that in here. And if I just show you the mic options here, I'm using close to and tree to to really give that definition there. And it sounds particularly percussive. I'm also using the three flutes flutter. Which has a really characterful sound to it, almost kind of Bernard Herrmann-esque. And then I'm also using the piccolo trill at the top. 
So by using these slightly different kind of articulations, you're able just to get a little bit more kind of texture in there. I've also used quite a lot of percussion, as you can probably imagine. If we just solo this. So I've moved from a soft stick to a hard stick on the timpani. I've also got the trash can and the anvil. And then the toys are slightly harder. Something I noticed in the Cookie Factory cue from uh, Edward Scissorhands was that Danny Elfman likes to use this sort of tick tock, tick tock sound. I've also got the military drum and snare drum from the BBC SO as well, which gives it a sense of depth. Now, if I just show you the way I've mixed this in, um, I'm actually using a combination of mix one, the close wide and the stereo microphone. So it's a little bit closer than you might imagine normally. And it's the same story for the military drum as well. This just helps to give it the kind of closeness that it needs to match with the other elements, but also the sense of the room as well at Maida Vale. I think it makes a huge difference by having the harps in there as well. So I've got these playing these crazy chords. And again, it just creates that sense of rising, which really helps when transitioning into new sections. In this next section, I'm kind of taking a bit of inspiration from the tune, and I'm having a little bit of a solo here between the oboe and the cor anglais legatos. And again, if you listen to the main sketch, it was all in there from the start, really. So in this case, we've got like B minor, and then also kind of D flat major above it. And so it creates that slight kind of bitonal nature that everything isn't quite right. This is something that Danny Elfman does a lot in Edward Scissorhands in particular, combining two chords from completely different keys and just sort of mangling them together. One thing to note as well is that we've increased in uh, tempo here. I was going to save this for the end, but just to show you that I'm always changing the tempo. I want it to feel very musical, and sometimes I find that film scores can sound a little bit kind of monotonous when they're all at the same tempo. So generally, because the piece is getting a little bit more agitated, it gradually gets faster and faster anyway. But even in the early sections, I'm introducing little tempo curves just to make it a little bit more kind of, a little bit more natural sounding, I suppose. So at this slightly faster tempo, suddenly everything kind of ramps up a little bit. And so little runs that I've got, like the staccato bassoons. I'm using a combination of tree two and close two here, so I really want to get the definition of those notes. And so things like that just help to kind of fill in the gaps. I've also got these staccato bass clarinet notes. Next, the tune moves to a clarinet. You can hear that I'm also just using a single clarinet. I find that this helps just to make it sound a little bit more vulnerable. I'm also using just a couple of little effects here as well. And also using the bass flute again as well. At this point, the strings are just doing straight quavers. Using pizzicato, just to kind of ramp up the tension. And you can see I'm also, because I'm now in 4-4, I'm using a kind of 1-2-1-2 one, two, one, two on the basses. Mm -hmm. 
So again, this just kind of ramps up the tension a little bit, adds to the kind of sense of adrenaline as if there might be a chase happening or something like that. I'm using the brass really sparingly and it's actually relatively quiet in this mix. When we record film scores, we tend to record them section by section. So we'll do a brass section, woodwind section, string section. So when I'm mixing things together, I want to make sure that each element is balanced within the kind of family that it comes from. So you'll notice that the brass is quite balanced on its own. And the same goes for the strings as well. So as long as they're balanced, I find that it sounds quite realistic. It doesn't matter too much that the woodwinds are maybe unnaturally loud for an orchestral piece like this. This little two bar transition is something I find often happens in Danny Elfman's music. So I've just used a few different chords here and uh, it sounds like this. It's sort of like a Mickey Mousing kind of mimicking sound, um, but I find that it works really well if you want to move into a different gear. So I'm using the contrabass clarinet and the contrabassoon staccatos here. And then I'm using the bass flute as well. Along with the uh, flutes flutter. Generally the harmony is moving in the same direction here, so it's kind of gradually moving down into that new gear. I'm using the harps here again as well, just to kind of bring out the harmony. And again, it just feels like a little bit of a roller coaster. It's coming up and then it's going away again. The percussion is staying pretty much the whole way through here, moving to a hard stick as I want to kind of move towards the reprise at the end. It's still quiet in the mix, but that kind of percussive nature gives it a little bit more accent. So then we've got this reprise of the melody at the end, but instead of it being in the same key, it's sort of in the same key, but it's slightly reharmonized. And so you've got these rising notes from underneath. So these are actually in kind of second inversion chords. So we've got an A flat major, but with an E flat in the bass, which gives it this sense of kind of arrival. So each of those notes are just rising, and then the next section. So we're safely in G minor again. If I just show you how that works with the rest of the orchestra. So with the oboe and the flutes, they're just playing the tune. And the three flutes are really powerful here. I'm using the close two and tree two to really bring out the kind of airy quality of the notes there. I'm using the contrabass clarinet and the contrabassoon as well just to bring out those low notes. But to keep the kind of driving rhythm up, I'm also using the bass clarinet and the bassoons. And also with those little darting rhythms, it just kind of feels like we're rising towards the ending. And again, I'm also kind of accelerating through here as well. So we end at 160 BPM. Now in a similar way to before, I've also got these two bars of slight kind of transitions. And that sounds like a kind of euphoric finish, um, almost like an overture. Really what it's doing is we've just got several different regions that are all doing scales up to or down to the main notes of the scale. So the cor anglais, uh, the oboe, the clarinets, and the bass clarinets.
bassoons and then we've got things like the flute and piccolo rips that just sort of help rise up to the top I've also got a combination here of the celeste and one harp going up and another harp going down and I'm actually changing the articulation here I'm using the damped harp so it really does release quickly finally just to add a bit of drama I'm also using the rolls on the bass drum the snare drum and the military drum Last but not least, of course, we've got the strings. I <laughs> couldn't forget those. Uh, just a little run up to the top, really. So you can see that we're not actually doing the same notes. It sounds a little bit messy on its own, really. But as long as it ends in the right place, that is really just a musical gesture. So if I show you how that kind of sounds in the context of everything else. As long as we arrive at E flat major, all in one piece, all should be fine. Now just one final thing to kind of show you is the, the amount of automation I've used in this piece. You can see that almost every line has got lots of little lines of automation and this has allowed me to create that slightly more hybrid texture because I'm able to bring each element out and really without having all those mic positions I wouldn't have been able to kind of dial in the exact sound that I wanted. This is something that I learned from Jake Jackson. He tends to kind of fade in a region when it starts. So as you can see here, with this piccolo, for example. It's just a slight fade in. It's just a little bit less jarring than if I were to come straight in. Um, it would have sounded a little bit too harsh, I think. Now, it's worth kind of noting the various things that I've used to input um, the information to kind of get the most out of the library. I'm using three faders on my keyboard here. I've got the mod wheel, which is CC1. This controls the kind of general dynamics from the quietest up to the very loudest layers. Then I've also got expression, which is CC11. So that's the kind of general volume. And I use this to balance things. And I find that it's particularly useful for almost compressing the dynamic range a little bit on the way in so what I'll do is I'll have at the quietest dynamics I'll have the expression right up at the top and then as it gets louder I'll turn the expression down a little bit so that it kind of compresses it slightly and then at the very top I'll push them both up to the top so that helps just to kind of give a slight s curve to um, to the volume and I find that works quite well finally we've got controller 21 which is zero vibrato a little bit of vibrato and then a lot of vibrato at the top and I like to use all three faders sort of in conjunction with each other just to get the most most out of the libraries. In terms of mixing, really all I'm using on most of these elements is just a bit of EQ. So I'm just kind of cutting out the low end, boosting frequencies that I like, cutting out frequencies I don't. It sounds very simple. And then in general, I tend to kind of boost some of the high end, particularly on the woodwind in those percussive elements. I really want them to kind of shine out. Um, I mentioned the choir before. I'm using the Sound Toys Echo Boy just to give it a little bit of a kind of upper edge sheen. And I'm also using the Pro R Reverb here. This is the three second. I've got it set as an orchestral default um, and I find that that works really well just to kind of keep it bubbling away. Because of that I've then kept the release of the Labs Choir particularly low so it's quite easy to control in that way. Um, for the more percussive elements I'm using a combination of the Pro C2 by FabFilter, this is a compressor and then I'm also using uh, an EQ as well. Generally, and this is another tip that I learned from Jake Jackson, is just to mix every element to sound as good as it possibly can on its own. So I'll listen to things in isolation and then I'll balance things afterwards. And having set uh, presets for myself for each of these instruments, I can just load in my template and it sounds great from the very beginning, which is really helpful. You can see in my track stacks here that I've got several buses. So I'll have winds longs, wind shorts, I might have some effects as well. And this basically changes uh, depending on how much reverb I want to send. So for short notes, when they kind of release immediately, I don't need quite as much reverb as the longs. Now it might sound counterintuitive to use reverb at all on something that's dry sounding. Why would you want to add more reverb afterwards? In a word, just control really. By having a small acoustic environment, you can get that really reflective sound, but you do want to get a little bit of a tail afterwards because it just helps to kind of glue things together. And so in this case, I'm using two buses. I'm using one with a little plate. So this is by Sound Toys as well, just a two second plate. And then I've also got the FabFilter Pro R. And again, this is set to three seconds on a slightly brighter sound. So it sounds a little bit more like a concert hall. Finally, on my output, I've got an SSL compressor by Waves. This is a 10 millisecond attack and an auto release. And then I'm also using the CLA-2A by Waves. This is compressing up to about 1 dB. I'm really not compressing very much at all. Next, I've got this Pro-Q3. This is the third and final tip from Jake Jackson, is to use it set to side. So this helps just to kind of broaden the stereo image a little bit, boosting the low end at 82 hertz, cutting out some of the mid-range, and then boosting at 7K 
and 16K just to kind of give it that upper edge. And again, I'm cutting down here under 30 hertz because there isn't very much happening under there. Finally, just a couple of little like mastering things. I use the J37. This is the mastering fat tight and open sound. I just particularly like the way it sounds on tape. Uh, and then I'm also using the Abbey Road mastering chain. This is just something that I tend to throw on. The last thing on my output is the Paz Analyzer by Waves. And this is just to check that I haven't got any kind of extraneous frequencies. You'll see I've got Sonar Works, which I've turned off now for the purposes of this video, but I use this as a sense of kind of room calibration. So it keeps my speakers nice and flat within my room. That's it. Uh, that's how I wrote a piece in the style of Edward Scissorhands by Danny Elfman. Thank you so much to Spitfire Audio for having me. If you haven't seen already, I have a YouTube channel of my own, which I've been given permission to plug. So do check out my channel down below if you want more videos like this. Thanks very much, and I hope to see you very soon.